In our last study, we traced the history of Abraham's descendants and found out why there will be no peace in the Middle East anytime soon. This is the conflict that has been going on for thousands of years, starting with one family, Abraham's. We determined that the promises God gave to Abraham, many of which have yet to be fulfilled, are still designated to go to Isaac's seed. In part two of Abraham's descendants, we will go over Isaac's lineage and who they are today. Are the Jews who are currently fighting to establish their state Isaac's seeds? What does the Bible say? Who will finally inherit the Holy Land? And before we get started, let me just say that this study emphatically teaches the Bible just as it reads, and as we believe it is divinely interpreted. There are many who have taken the Palestinian side or pro-Israeli, and we are saddened by the loss of life on both sides. This study does not endeavor to dehumanize one side or the other. We're not taking sides. It seeks to clarify long misinterpreted applications and help bring an end to the strife through the truth. It may seem to some a hopeless cause, for we know there will be a gigantic war in the Middle East surrounding Jerusalem. God says he will gather all nations at Jerusalem. But we also know that both Palestinians and Israelis and all others who call the Middle East home have an opportunity to welcome Jesus in their heart and enter his kingdom when he calls. Now that we have that established, okay, who of Abraham's seed are the children of promise? We know that it only can come from the line of Isaac, okay, the 12 tribes of Israel. We must fast forward to see what happened to them. So fast forward, after the 12 tribes are created, they are called Israelites, they become a nation, They're, they become a great people in Egypt. They leave Egypt and go to take the promised land but they do not retain it because of their own unfaithfulness. We see that in time, the children of Israel apostatized and God drove Israel, 10 tribes from his holy land by Assyria. That's in 2 Kings 18 verses nine through 12. And because they were driven out, they, they assimilated into those Gentile nations and they lost their racial identity. Now there are only two tribes left, the two tribe kingdom of Judah. But Judah is unfaithful as well. So he also allows Judah, the two tribe kingdom, to go into captivity. First they go under Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Grecia, and then by the time of Christ, Rome. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 24. So then, then the Messiah comes, Jesus. He comes to not the all 12 tribes, it's just the two tribes, right? The two tribes, the two, two tribe kingdom of Judah he comes to. That's all that's left by the time Jesus comes. He comes to redeem them. But they rejected and crucified him. So what happens because of that re rejections? We're going to look closely at this. After the crucifixion of Jesus... And then the subsequent continued rejection of the gospel by the Jews. Remember, they persecuted the apostles and early Christians, and the gospel goes out to the Gentiles. And during the time of the Christian era, uh, up until the latter days, almost 2,000 years, the Christian Jews lost their racial identity by marrying Gentiles. Thus today, we have two classes of Jews, the identifiable Jews, identified by their color, skin, facial features, etc. And we're talking about the Jews that we know to be Jewish people today and who have returned to their homeland since 1948. And then we have the other class, which are the unidentifiable Christian Jews who assimilate from the time of the Christian religion being established shortly after the crucifixion who assimilated and look like Gentiles and are currently spread throughout the world. 
So here lies a type. There is a type that is revealed by the two thieves, the two Jewish thieves that were on either side of Christ on the cross. The one on his left would represent the Orthodox Jews who rejected the Messiah. And the one on his right who asked him, you know, Lord, can I come into your kingdom? He represents the Jews, the Christian Jews who accepted Christ as the Messiah. And they have since lost their racial identity. Now, there's a basic misunderstanding, a mistaken application that almost the entire Christian world believes about which Jews are blessed. They misapply that to the Jews that are currently in Palestine, okay? And this misapplication is the cause of the current world clashes in the Middle East, the clash where America, the last king of the North, is supporting the state of Israel with arms and military might against the other descendants of Abraham, the modern day Ishmaelites, the Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites. For this misapplication to be corrected, it needs to be understood that the identifiable Jews there in Israel now rejected their Messiah, Jesus, and after a time, the Lord rejected them and chose the Christian Jews as his people. This is clear in the Bible, both through prophecy and explicit instruction. The time frame that the Jewish people had to repent is seen in the 2300 days prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9. God gave a pre-designated time for Israel to reconcile their sins as a nation. Their probation ended in 34 AD as they rejected the preaching of the apostles and put them to death. This is found in Daniel 9.24 and Acts 13.46, which states, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Thus, the promises in the Bible to Judah and Israel in the latter days do not apply to them, but to the Christian Jews. This is when the blessings are transferred from the Israelites to the Christian Jews. And where are the Christian Jews now? They are in one of the Christian churches. Who are they? Only God knows the generations of these Christian Jews who look like Gentiles that have descended from the seed of Abraham. He knows Jesus' generation back to David, to Abraham and to Adam. In this genealogical record, he knows every Christian Jew who married Gentiles and lost their racial identity and who descended down to our day, who are in his true church and who will be sealed as one of the 144,000. And from our previous studies, um, we know that out of the Pro Protestant Reformation were birthed six divinely established churches, the Lutherans by Martin Luther, the Presbyterians, John Knox, the Methodists, John Wesley, the Millerites, William Miller, the Baptists, Baptist by Immersion, and lastly, the Seventh-day Adventists. The only next church on this continuum is, of course, God's church purified, okay, without spot or blemish. This church is yet future and will happen by God's hand only. He will take the reins in his own hands. And we will see later on in the study that this church will be established by none other than Abraham's seed. So how do we know this? How can we be so sure of this bold assertion? The answer lies in the Bible, God's authoritative word. This is the rule book by which we are to test each doctrine. We will prove by the Bible, 
that the Protestant churches are represented as Israel in these last days. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the last of these Protestant churches to be established, is represented by the term Judah. This secret is revealed through prophetic symbols in the cryptic book of Ezekiel, which we will read in just a few moments. But before we do, let's ask a question to flex your critical thinking caps. Why is it so far-fetched that God would have a movement of people who hold the annals of doctrinal truth in the Christian dispensation? Does the cross obliterate God's reasoning and methods? To be clear, there are differences between the typical system, the Old Testament period, and the anti-typical period. We are no longer in the sacrificial system. But if we study carefully, we will see that God's chain of truth exists in the New Testament period as well. Let's take a closer look at the dispersion of the Christians during the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd centuries. We must remember that the early Christian church has both Jews and Gentiles, and by intermarrying, they become mixed. But as we will see, God has always kept track of his bloodline. To learn about this history, we read from The Great Controversy, page 40, paragraph 1 and 2. Persecutions, beginning under Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready, for the sake of gain, to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion, and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public fates. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Wherever they sought refuge, the followers of Christ were hunted like beasts of prey. They were forced to seek concealment in desolate and solitary places. Destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. The catacombs afforded shelter for thousands. Beneath the hills outside the city of Rome, long galleries had been tunneled through earth and rock. The dark and intricate network of passages extended for miles beyond the city walls. In these underground retreats, the followers of Christ buried their dead. And here also, when suspected and prescribed, they found a home. When the life-giver shall awaken those who have fought the good fight, many a martyr for Christ's sake will come forth from those gloomy caverns. This map shows how the Christian church begins to spread throughout the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, and parts of Asia. It leaves Jerusalem, the vineyard, and goes into the wilderness, away from the Holy Land. This movement of God's church is also detailed in Revelation 12. Here, the Church of God is depicted as a woman. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. The woman represents God's church from the beginning of time, separated in two divisions. First, the period without the written word is represented by the moon underneath the woman's feet. That is, 
The moon being a reflection of the sun depicts the oral tradition of father to son passing on the word of God generation to generation until the time of Moses. With Moses comes the writing of the first five books of the Bible, the written word. The period with the Bible is represented as the woman being clothed with the sun. The dragon standing ready to devour the woman's child is the devil starting persecution even before the Messiah even comes. We have on record Herod's diabolical ordering of all male babies to be slain, the subsequent persecution and crucifixion of Christ, the persecution of the apostles and the early Christians, all these events lead to her flight into the wilderness. Since a wilderness is just the opposite of a vineyard, the statement that she might fly into the wilderness emphatically implies that she must have left the vineyard, and that is precisely what she did. Shortly after the resurrection, the church, the woman, left the Holy Land, the vineyard, and went to the land of the Gentiles, the wilderness. We also have the biblical meaning of the vineyard. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, Isaiah 5, 7 says. Unquestionably, therefore, the wilderness, where the woman was nourished for the time being, is the land of the Gentiles. And the woman's having to flee from the face of the serpent in her homeland shows that the dragon had made the Holy Land his headquarters. Not satisfied with this, though, he even followed her into the wilderness. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Verse 15. It is at this exact moment that the devil sees his persecution of the church will not kill this fledgling religion, the gospel of Christ. So instead of persecution, he endeavors to eradicate the religion of Christ, life flooding the church with his converts. At this point, Rome adopts Christianity out of a strategy to re retain power. A new religion is created through the combination of paganism and Christianity. Pagans are paid to convert to Christianity and the demolishing of pagan temples is encouraged through governmental inducements and payoffs. Soon, the Sabbath is changed by the church from the seventh day, Saturday, to the first day of the week, Sunday, all in order to appease the pagans. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice that this dragon wars not against a remnant of the flood, but against the remnant of the woman's seed, her seed. Christ being the woman's only child, her seed are therefore the Christians, those who are born into the church through the spirit of Christ. Now there is a period of time, the Dark Ages, period of 1260 years, where the Roman church holds absolute religious power and um, persecutes the true people of God. This is known as the Dark Ages. Some people call it the Middle Ages. But we want to fast forward to the immigration of Protestants in Europe to the New World. The first Protestants to arrive in the Americas in the early 17th century were theological and religious descendants of the Protestant Reformation. Colonists from Northern Europe introduced Lutheran, Congregational, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Calvinism, Quakerism, Anabaptist, and the Moravian Church to the Plymouth, Massachusetts, New Netherland, Virginia, and Carolina colonies. Let's look at some of these groups. England, a small group of pilgrims who settled the Plymouth Colony in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620, 
seeking refuge from conflicts in England, which led up to the English Civil War. Later came the Puritans, a much larger group than the Pilgrims, who established the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1629 with 400 settlers. Puritans were English Protestants who wished to reform and purify the Church of England in the New World of what they considered to be unacceptable residues of Roman Catholicism. Within two years, an additional 2,000 settlers arrived. Beginning in 1630, some 20,000 Puritans immigrated as families to New England to gain the liberty to worship as they chose. Germany. The first group of Germans to settle in Pennsylvania arrived in Philadelphia in 1683 from Krefeld, Germany, and included Mennonites and possibly some Dutch Quakers. These mostly German settlers would become the Pennsylvania Dutch. Germany was also home to perhaps the most famous Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, who translated the New Testament into his native language and preach the Bible and the Bible only. Louis XIV's 1685 revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had offered religious freedom to Protestants and ended the Protestant-Catholic wars in France, effectively ended religious freedom for Protestants. As a result of this edict, French Huguenots could either convert to Catholicism face life in a prison or convent, or flee the country. This led to the diaspora of an estimated 200,000 French Protestant Ugno refugees. They were spread throughout Europe and North America in what is known as the Le Refuge. These Ugnos often intermingled and intermarried with earlier French Protestant refugees from the Spanish Netherlands. By the time of the American Revolution, Many of these refugee families had achieved significant political and economic power in their host nations, often leveraging refugee networks that crossed the Atlantic and spanned generations as part of a larger Protestant international. To summarize, the theological and religious descendants of the Protestant Reformation and also children of Abraham's seed arrived in the United States in the early 17th century. In return, the religious freedoms found in the New World are conducive to the spread of Christianity throughout the world. <laughs>